Good evening. Typical ethical weather. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. This is a special day. Special because 11 people that were connected very strongly with our program has passed away. And thinking about this for the last six months, Bob Rule and I discussed how tough it is to lose 11 players for this team. And it's gratifying to know that you all came back to honor your teammates. And Steve and I are thinking about another book called Teammates Are Forever. And this is an indication of what teammates are. When you have all these people show up, Texas, Arizona, California trip was canceled, but Steve Arms called me this afternoon and he said, you know, I miss those great days and uh, we miss him. But um, yeah. coaching the years I coached, 1971 was pretty special, mainly because in 1970, I felt we had a very, very strong team, but the champion was selected by committee. So we didn't have enough votes. We didn't have enough Southern votes, yet we were undefeated. Had a great defense, great offense, and lost by committee. And in the following year, a good friend of mine, Bruce Allison, uh, fought hard to get the NCAA to endorse the playoffs. So in a way, in my mind, it was a payback for the poor players that played in the 70s that should have been champions, and they weren't. But you guys came ahead, played hard, from the first day in the polo bonds to the last run we had, which is before we went to Hostra, it, it was just a tremendous feeling. So I'd like to thank you all, and I'd like you all to stand up, all the players, all the players. Let's have a... Let's have a... Let's have a nice... Let's have a nice round of applause. Thank you, have a great evening. Uh, before we get Jay up here, that reminds me, we have 50 photocopies of an article this week that came out in the Ithaca Times uh, that I wrote that Richie wanted me to, he wanted me to tell the community and for you to have copies of what this team meant to him. And I want to make sure I was speaking accurately on your behalf, because I said a lot of guys have told me that they were decent players, they were good students, but there's one guy that taught them how to be a leader, and I'm just wondering if that's accurate. <laughs> there are copies of that newspaper article inside, and Richie would uh, appreciate it if everybody took one. Jay. <clears throat> the glare off my head. Yeah. This is a, a very important uh, Richie Moran tradition. And I'm honored to lead you all in the singing of God Bless America. Let me play the opening note. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her. Through the night with the light from above, from the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. 
God bless America, my home, sweet home. Uh, to start off our memorial ceremony, I wanted to point out there's something that you folks will see later. Looking for. We have a photograph of each of the gentlemen we're honoring tonight. Uh, we have their photo, and we have a little quote from Richie on each one that Bob's going to read for you. But I'm going to read the first one. Number 32, Craig Bollinger, the quiet man, a great leader, a momentum changer with a real ability to make things happen. And I would like to welcome Craig's brother, Wade. Um, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity today. I, I uh, remember this team and watching the games myself. I presently live here in Ithaca. Uh, uh, Craig, I think, um, uh, was a, a strong athlete, and he had the opportunity and the luck to play on this team. And um, he tragically uh, ended his life in almost 30 years ago. Uh, he had a lot of other passions in life, um, and I think that um, his opportunity to play here really led him in a lot of ways in, in life and playing for Richie. And um, I, I'm sure if he was here today that he would appreciate all everybody getting together and um, and all the camaraderie and the, the teamwork and, the, and getting the team together. So thank you. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Make sure. Uh, what I'm going to do is this. We've done, we've done Craig. I'm going to re really go right down, and I will read what Richie wrote about each player. And later on, these will be inside so you can see them and read them and contemplate if you like. Then I will simply ask, would you like to say a word or two about the player? A sentence or two, okay? We really are, I'm a real taskmaster with time. So think about it. And uh, my example I gave, I think in my email was uh, Bruce Teague. How would I describe him? Dynamic. He was a dynamic individual. And that's how he played the game. So something like that. A sentence or two would be fine. Now, what I'd like to do next is Bob Buman, who uh, is very special for me, certainly. He made me a much, much better goalie than I think I ever would have been. He pushed me so hard. We became great friends 40 years after we played together. And his one of his best friends is here today. A lot of you know him as Buck Briggs. Let me read what, what Richie said about Bob, and then Buck would like to speak a few words about his friend. Now, now if I only knew his number, we'd be good shape. 14? 11, thank you. Oh, you guys are making fun of me already. I can't stand it now. <laughs> all right. Bob Human. these are Richie's words. Admired by all, always ready to step into the goal when necessary. Helped solidify our Ivy League title and was key in helping us win the national championship. I'm going to add one more sentence. I think Bob Buman still holds the record for the most saves in a championship game. Uh, gave up six goals. I think he made 24 saves. Uh, certainly, uh, he made the game, that game, a lot farther apart than it really was. Uh, a game that will, uh, again, as, as good a game a goaltender ever played, the championship game. And I had the pleasure to watch it on the sidelines. And... Uh, <laughs> But I could not take anything away from it. It was a great game by a great goaltender. So now, Buck would like to say a few words. Thank you, Bobby. Could you hold this for a second, Bobby? Oh, sure. Can I go back to all the Well, I can only do so much, right? Uh, you know, it's an honor to be here. I was not a member of the team, but largely thanks to Bob, I got to meet so many of you. And it really is one of the more important connections I've made in life is to be with you guys. We met in an NCAA championship tournament, and we just clicked immediately. You know Bob. He's a, he was a complicated guy. 
but we we developed a friendship that was really unlike any that I ever had. He was living out on Long Island, and I was in Manhattan working for the NFL and teaching up here at Cornell Law School and also coming up for athletic events. And he'd drive out from Northport, sometimes take two, two and a half hours to pick me up at my apartment in the city, drive all the way up through, sometimes through the snow, sleet, hail in the mountains of Pennsylvania. And we just loved it. We just laughed. We talk about life and music and politics, sometimes things we didn't know anything about, like women. And, um, you know, it was, it was just a joy for Bob to come up here and, and spend time with me. Uh, he was uh, visiting me when, when my mom died in 03. And I'll never forget this. He stopped off at my parents' house on the way back to Long Island. And he said, I've had this migraine headache for about five days, and I just can't shake it. And I said, well, you, you know, you really ought to check into that, Bob. Why don't you just spend the night here at, at my folks' house? And he, he drove down, and the next thing I heard was a, a call from his daughter, Heather. Many of you know Heather that he was seen, found on his hands and knees on the Long Island Expressway. And he was taken to the hospital and soon was found out he had glioblastoma, which is one of the most unforgiving things that, that a human being could get. And he put up a good fight. He had, uh, he had one surgery that prolonged things a little bit. Uh, Bobby and Glenn and I came up once and in my barn where we should have been last night, but that's another story. I got a picture of him and me on the blinder that pulls over a window that was in the Royal Palms. And we came up that night and, and Bobby and Glenn kept him diverted. And I put it on the window and covered his eyes and brought him in and pulled it down over one of the Theodore Zinks windows and a picture of me and him in front of the window of the Palms. And that was, that was the last time Bob was ever here. Um, as he was um, losing his battle, I was sort of helped uh, getting rid of some of his items, and he had this truck. You can see it out there, that 1993 Ford Explorer in the second row there. And I bought it for him from 500 bucks in uh, 2013, and it's still on the road. Uh, COVID winter, a bunch of rodents got into it, and it completely infested the air conditioning and heating system and chewed up a bunch of wires. And I took it to get fixed, and the guy said, he goes, well, this thing has 218,000 miles on it. It's going to cost me a couple thousand to fix it. I'm sure you don't want to do that. I said, oh, you are so wrong. Fix that thing. Uh, after Bob passed away, I got a call from his daughter, Heather, saying, stop by the house. She lived around the corner from me in Manhattan. And I went up to see her, and um, she gave me a little plastic container, a little plastic pill container that contained some of Bob's ashes. And I've had it in that glove compartment of his truck for almost seven years. He died 12, 13, 14. Typical joker, because the next sequential days are going to be 01, 02, 03. So even Bob, when he's out of control of things, sticks in a little humor. Uh, at the memorial service for the passing of Glenn Mueller's dad, Bobby and I were there, and we went over to see Bob in hospice in Huntington. And we walked up to the front desk, and we said, we're here to see Bob Buman. And the woman behind the desk gave that sort of furtive glance to her colleague and, and she came over and said to me and Bobby uh, he passed away but he's he's still in the room if you'd like to go see him so Bobby and I went in the room for a while and it was uh, a very profound experience I still have the little Cornell towel that he had on the bed at that point and um, I've had his ashes in that thing ever since and I drive around, and he drives around with me. And as I was coming over here thinking something to say, I was thinking, nobody loved life more than Bob. Nobody was more irreverent than Bob. Nobody was less afraid to do something that nobody else would ever dream of doing. Bob would hate to have missed this party. So I have news for all of you. When I pulled in, I reached into the glove compartment. Here's Bob's ashes right here. They've been there for almost seven years. Bob and teammates miss you. Life is immeasurably less valuable and joyful without you. Thank you for introducing me to this group, and thank you for letting me exceed my time limit. Thank you, Bob. That was wonderful. Now I think I'm going to go back and forth to pick people out here.
Number 40, Matt Olinsky. One of the few three-sport athletes at Cornell, lacrosse, basketball, and football, he uses imposing size to create an obvious panic on the opposing sideline. He was a big boy. Uh, would anybody like to say sentence or two about, about Matt? Okay. Well, I would just say Matt was very quiet. I didn't know Matt really well. I think he was from Vestal. He was from Vestal. Uh, good out all around athlete, though, as they said. He was big. He was. Uh, I was a little shrimp on the team compared to everybody else that played in front of me. But Matt was an, a nice guy, quiet guy, and a very, very good teammate. I get my exercise. <laughs> ah. Uh, number 14, Bruce T. And his brother Neil. Neil. Neil's not here, is he? I don't think so. But he was at the football game today. That was very nice and wished us all well now. We're hoping he would come for this. A remarkable ground ball specialist, a tremendous hustler who could run all day. Uh, I had used a single word to describe him when I asked. It was dynamic on the field. He was a dynamic individual. And the energy lifted whenever he played. Uh, would anybody like to say anything? Who? Big Heart. Okay, thank you. The Geneva Flash. Geneva Flash. Flash what? Everything. <laughs> All right, Geneva Flash. Yes, Billy. Joe <laughs> shit the rag, man. Thank you. Thanks for lowering the standards of this. Uh, thing. That was wonderful. Billy's getting up to speak. Come on, Bill. He gave me my nickname on a bus trip with Bobby Shaw and the team, rest of the team. And that's as far as I'm going to go with that. But uh, we refereed together uh, for 30. I did it for 34 years. But, uh, Bruce did it for 35. But every college game that we officiated, we would talk the next day. We talk about the coaches, we talk about the players, the plays. So we had a great time. I became a very, very close friend for him. And I'm, I miss him. Thank you, Billy. Ralphie. Uh, Ralphie. <laughs> yes, a blast from the past. The word Ralphie. Uh, and now we have 25, Glenn Mueller. Uh, again, from uh, Richie, I knew Glenn since he was nine years old, and his skill sets made him an outstanding two-sport athlete. His willingness to run over rather than sidestep opponents resulted in an opponent scout report referring to Glenn, him as the mule. I can speak firsthand about in practice how hard he worked, and if I stepped out of the goal and wasn't looking where I was going, he would run me right over. And so he actually, again, one of the guys that made me a much better goaltender than I was, and um, in his obituary, I wrote one line, then I'll let other people speak. Um, the line was, if friendships, if marriages were like Glenn and mine's friendship, no one would get divorced. Uh, he and I were friends, teammates, roommates for 56 years. Uh, from the time he was in high school, he was a sophomore, when I first met him, Father, I was a junior. First two months, I thought he was an elective mute. I never heard him say a word. And then I realized when I met his three sisters and the mother, why? I don't think he learned how to talk till he was nine years old. So I'm sorry. I would like, would anybody like to talk about Glenn? Do it. Gentleman yeah. and a warrior. What? Gentleman and a warrior. Gentleman and a warrior. Teddy well put. Down. Frankie? Teddy bear. Rock solid. Teddy bear. <laughs> Never to me, but yes, the teddy bear. He was all those things. I would always say, and I'm saying this for John Morehouse and the football guys here, Glenn was the best end at Cornell who never played football. And he was a terrific football player in high school. I once asked Glenn, why didn't you play football? And he said, I wanted my GPA to be above a 1.0. So I understood that. But he was a wonderful human being, wonderful player. And uh, it's all the all things you guys said is just so true about Glenn. Pardon me? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Sure. issue this year and I had mine and the strength I got from Glenn he, he was Superman to me and no matter what happened to me I knew that Glenn was going through it. and I went through some difficult things but it was always so much easier because Glenn was going through it he never gave me a break every time he'd come and see me he'd go make a muscle make a muscle he goes just because you're sick it doesn't mean that you can't stay in shape and he was he was a wonderful friend and he was great support when we went through this and to be very honest, when we hit this final set of stairs and he didn't make it, uh, I couldn't process it. And I still have difficulty processing it because I drew so much strength from him. And he was, I never had a big brother, but if I had a big brother, I would like him to be exactly what Glenn was to me. And I know, I know you all miss him and I miss him in a, in a special sort of way. And he was very instrumental in me physically being here today because of the support that he gave me. Thank you, Buck. So, um, <clears throat> Richie, pro can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Richie probably won't remember this, but Glenn was, I thought Glenn was a pretty intense guy. Fair comment? Yeah. Okay. And I, you know, I hadn't, as a sophomore on the team, um, I was really excited about lacrosse. Like, really, because uh, I hadn't played in high school or anything. And, uh, and in practice, I'm as intense as I am in a game. It's just my style. And uh, so I remember in the practice, where Glenn was probably like trying to relax a little bit after we just had a game or something, I was always working on it, right? So we had a situation where uh, he was really kind of pissed off at me. And so Richie sent us down on Hoy Field one day. If you all know where Hoy Field is. I told some of you this story last night. And we went down there, and he said, I just want you to run around there, and I want Glenn to shoot on you. <laughs> and none of you saw this, but Glenn was not happy with me. Now, later I got to where I totally respected him, but I was a little annoyed at him because he's running around with the ball and taking shots at me. And I wasn't happy that we were down there because he wasn't happy that I played him aggressively in practice. And... Uh, it was quite an, quite an experience because, you know, Glenn could really let that ball rip. And then later in the re more recent years, um, I really got to have a really um, nice, warm feeling for him. That's all I can. Thank you, Brooke. Yes. Sure. I met Glenn because I had a good friend named Lynn Lonke who was a starting forward on the basketball team. And he was rooming with Glenn at Ira Reed's chicken farm. And uh, so I got to know Glenn very early on. But, or tur a turkey farm, turkey farm. You know, but I was an engineer, not an Aggie. But my, my favorite Glenn Mueller story was one, at one game, he ran across the crease and threw in the goal behind his back. And he came over to the sidelines, and the story I was told was he came up to Richie, and Richie said five words. Good thing it went in. <laughs> I miss Glenn. Glenn was a great guy and, and a great friend. Thank you, Jay. Uh, yes. Oh, Glenn. Okay, I'm sorry, Billy. <laughs> First two years at Sigma Phi, he never said a damn word. Um, so he's very quiet. But he really started coming to life when he moved back here to Ithaca and took the job at Cornell. Just awesome. Talk, 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 talk. Great, great. And he was really on the right path. He reconnected with a good friend, Sue, and it was going in the right direction and unfortunately he didn't make it. Here's to Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. One day Glenn had, again, had just been diagnosed. I was with Buck, who was anticipating a heart transplant, and it was me. And the three of us sitting there, and Buck turned to Glenn and said, who would think it that Bob Rue would be the healthiest guy of the three of us? <laughs> I said, thank you, Buck. That was a great compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Tom, my God.
saw enough action during the season to be a letter winner and helped his teammates with his desire to do his very best. I love guys like Ty Migat. Some people don't know I coached for 38 years, 700 games. And guys like Ty Migat, I came to respect incredibly. Not maybe as talented as other people. Didn't, didn't get it on the field a whole lot. Yet he worked as hard as anybody in practice, never complained, was there, ready to go when he got his chance. And I, as I coached more and more, gained more and more respect for people like that. And he was that kind of guy. As, as uh, Richie says, because Richie knew people, and helped his teammates with his desire to do his very best. So I salute Tom, my guy, for doing what he did. Okay, where's Tom? Number 47, Harry Nicolaitis. I think Harry was the first of our group to, to pass away. Young, too young, way too young. A Naval Academy transfer whose knowledge of the game and work ethic made him a great motivator and player. He even brought a case of champagne to the championship game, which and, and uh, tells you what kind of guy he was. Harry was a genuinely good guy. And to me, my life now, that's the best compliment I think I give anybody. He's a good guy. Would anybody like to speak about Harry? I knew Billy when I knew it, Billy. I know you guys were good friends. Yeah, let me come up. Well, the first thing, just a little comic relief, is one of the things that we used to make fun of him all the time is if you ever saw Harry play lacrosse, pull his shorts down around your ass and you start running because his pants were always falling off. Uh, and I mean, going on about the stories with him and his wife and uh, Black Jack, you all remember the, uh, the minor bird. But the, probably the, the, the most memorable story was, was we were, it was his last year, and we were at the 25th anniversary of, the, uh, of our game, and Harry was bound and determined to come. I mean, he was in a bad way. So we uh, were sitting around drinking beer, and all of a sudden we hear coaches whistle, and we realize we're flipping late. And Harry looks and says, Jesus Christ get us over there. And he's like frantic. So me and Guns start pushing the wheelchair and the shortcut was through the sand. We're running through the sand and I'm pushing the thing and Bucky's yelling faster, faster. So we finally get there and I'm like sweating. So finally we get to some grass and, and the gazebo is right there. Richie's standing there looking around impatiently. Uh, Bucky grabs the wheelchair and starts running across the grass, which obviously was a lot faster and doesn't realize, because it was in the sun, there was a, a curb there. He hits the curb. Harry goes catapulting, rolls across the floor. I thought Rich was going to actually die. Looks at him, and Harry looks up and says, Jesus Christ, Guns, you're going to kill me before the cancer does. <laughs> so he was just one of these um, great individuals. I, I think you're hearing a little theme here about good guys, good teammates, uh, if I was to look at this team, that's what I would say. That we're full of good guys and good teammates. And as I look back on it for myself, it was a privilege, really, to play with these guys. A privilege. And I, uh, as I get older, I realize how lucky I was. Next is 44, Jim Nowak. Made the courageous gesture of volunteering to play the goal after we lost our starting goalie to injury, despite his lack of experience. He might have changed the word, made the insane gesture of wanting to get in the goal. But he got in the goal and I said, volunteer for a position that has a lot of pain involved, especially if you don't know what you're doing. But he did it. And again, the kind of teammate he was to volunteer to do something like that. Would anybody like to say anything about Jim? Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, Jim was my year. Um, I, I don't remember what, what your recollections are of Jim, but he always had a smile and he had a really positive way about him. People remember that about him, or maybe you don't. Okay. And I, I was just a huge fan of his, and I thought it was fantastic that he stepped right up and said, I'll go and play in the goal. And, you know, that was really difficult because if Buck, Bucky were here, I'd pay him a tribute, right? Because we all know Bucky started out and in the first game of that, of, that season, 72 season, as I recall, um, Bucky went down with his knee thing. And Rachel wanted to just, you know, completely open up his knee. They, Bucky probably would have been fixed nowadays and back playing within six weeks or something like that. 
Jim Nowak and it was Bob Kelly. They both stepped in there. You know, it's like, and it was hard. I mean, they, they were having a hard time stopping balls from the restraining line. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. It was really tough. And we, you know, we could have repeated or come really close to repeating and getting the national championship again, second year in a row. Anyway, I was a really big fan of Jim Noax. He just had a real sparkle about him. Thank you, Jim. This is a difficult one for me to do, and I'll, I'll kind of explain. I actually wrote a, um, I was in a writing class, I wrote a paper about this individual. Uh, number 43, Hank Olivier. And the title of my article was, A Real Cornell Athlete. Now, we'll read what Richie said. He said, a backup goalie who was loved by all his teammates and put forth a tremendous effort in games and in practices. And what I mean about a real Cornell athlete, that was a guy, he was a third-string goalie, didn't get a lot of touches in the goal for obvious reasons. But he was there every day for practice for three years. Probably his playing time was... If it told a whole game, those three years would be a lot. Never complained, worked hard, funny guy, brilliant, became a doctor. Uh, and uh, it was years later that I realized there was a guy who played lacrosse for the true reason you should play it. He loved the sport. Wasn't being a star, wasn't being a starter. He loved the, com the camaraderie. He loved the practices. He really did. He made the most of what he did get in the goal. And I came to look upon him as a real athlete, a guy who played a game for all the right reasons. And for that, I, at the end of my paper, I said, I thank you, Hank Olivier, for being the athlete probably I should have been in terms of attitude. So he was a great guy. I wish I had known him better after college. I didn't see him and didn't find out from Coach Moran uh, years later when I started to feel his feelings and went looking for him that he had passed away, which is really a shame. He was truly a wonderful man and a good guy and a good teammate to go along with what we're talking about. Would anybody like to say anything about Hank? He was the quiet man on the field and off the field. He was. Thank you. Number 38, Larry Croucher, a hardworking defenseman who carried out his on-field assignments aggressively and enthusiastically. Larry was a hard worker. Larry did all the right things. Larry pushed his teammates. And again, with our theme of being a great teammate and a good guy. Would anybody like to speak about Larry? Okay. Are we all set? Okay. Do we have one more? Okay. Oh. <laughs> this, is a, this is like a curveball. All right, and this is, uh, this is not a player. Uh, this is somebody that, it was only years later, again, we get a little bit older and more mature, I realized what, what joy we brought to certain people who were involved with the team, but they were not playing the team. And one was, I love this first name, Orvis. Professor Orvis E. Scotty John Drew, who was our team's faculty advisor. And most of us remember him as a guy we'd see in the locker room, very supportive, uh, smiled, always said hello. Uh, and again, he was the team's faculty advisor for many years. Coach Moran is very grateful for Scotty's friendship, advice to me and to our players. Again, he fit in the mold of a good guy, great advisor because you really liked the guy. You trusted him. He was a good man. You respected him. And I felt he set a great example for all of us and, and how he, he purported himself in the world. Maybe I'd like to say anything about Scotty. All right, Coach Moran. Scotty was a tremendous advisor. We had young men that needed assistance, course selection, uh, tutoring. Scotty was the first one there. He would devote an hour of his day to make sure that all the players were doing the right thing in order to graduate. Uh, Scotty was like a father to me. He uh, did sensational things, both on the field and off the field. Outstanding professor and an outstanding person. Scotty, God rest you, buddy. Well, uh, I'm going to put forth a call to action. 
you see me taking all these notes, you see our photographers, videographers, we are going to compile a commemorative publication about this, a little magazine with photos from the event, from the game, from last night's event. And I'm going to ask you folks to please co-create this by sending Ruler an email at the end of the weekend or sometime soon, reasonable deadline. Uh, tell them what this meant to you. Tell them what it was like to reconnect with people. Tell them how it felt. Tell them what your favorite part of it was. Tell them uh, what you'll do for your 75-year reunion. And uh, as long as another thing I wanted to mention before Jay comes up, we're going to do the evening song and we're going to do the alma mater. Uh, I gave the lyric sheets out to people. But the last person we spoke about was uh, an advisor. And I have a piece of advice for you, Mr. Briggs. Uh, you said you have a hard time understanding women. I do too. But I do know chicks dig rodent-infested vehicles with 250,000 miles on them. So keep rolling with that, and you'll be golden. So, Jay, it's almost time to wrap this up and uh, head inside. Okay. I'm going to give the starting note, and hopefully you all will follow along. When the sun fades far away in the crimson of the west and the voices of the day murmur low and sink to rest, music with the twilight falls o'er the dreaming lake and dell. Tis an echo from the walls of our own, our fair Cornell. Welcome night and welcome rest, fading music, fare thee well. Joy to all we love the best, love to thee, our fair Cornell. Music with the twilight falls O'er the dreaming lake and dell Tis an echo from the walls Of our own, our fair Cornell Now I'm going to give the opening note for the alma mater. Anybody want to tackle that? Far above Cayuga's waters With its waves of blue Stands our noble alma mater Glorious to view Lift the chorus, speed it onward Loud her praises tell Hail to thee, our alma mater. Hail, all hail, Cornell. Far above the busy humming of the bustling town, reared against the arch of heaven, look she proudly down. Lift the chorus, speed it onward, loud her praises tell. Hail to thee, our alma mater, hail, all hail, Cornell. And of course, yes. Appropriately, last words, Coach Moran. Have a great time, and we got that sun. It's beautiful. And Bob and Steve, appreciate all your help. And let's have a moment of silence for our brothers, sisters. Thank you, and God bless you all in heaven. Bye. Okay. So, 
So I would like to offer sincere congratulations to the group of folks here that put Cornell Cross on the map nationally. You guys are exactly the program that our coaching staff who's here uh, this evening. You're the program that they emulate if they want to bring our current program back to. And, and we all know that. The, the, the class of 71 and, and, and the other classes that's built this amazing team. You guys established the foundation of what Cornell Lacrosse is today. And Cornell Lacrosse, and I've often heard this, and it's said in this way, everybody wants what we have. Everybody wants our camaraderie, our fellowship, our loyalty to one another. And guess where that started? It's not, a, it's not a difficult case. That started with an amazing individual who had a relentless will to win, but a re relentless will to invest in young players who would represent Cornell. And that's Richie Moran. Yeah. He, in, in my mind, in all honesty, in my mind, Richie cannot be given enough credit. We don't even know, none of us actually even know how much of his life he invested into Cornell Cross. And of course, Pat, if you don't have someone like Pat by your side, supporting everything you're doing, being a great mom, great, great uh, spouse, you can't get it done. And so I think we should recognize Pat. So I just want to offer a, a welcome to all of you back, back to Ithaca, back to Cornell, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have you back, and, and for me to have Richie be recognized and have so many of his, his players who love him, and to have Bones back, who was uh, connected at the hip with Richie, and let's give it up for Bones. Richie, is it true that, that Bones was the disciplinarian in that program? He was not the disciplinarian. I'm not kidding. I, I know that Bones was uh, put loose and fancy free a little bit, but uh, Richie was the man, and uh, Richie, extend heartfelt thanks to you for what you what you provided to Cornell University, Cornell Athletics, Cornell Lacrosse. There's never been anybody like you, Richie, in the Nerval Building. So, thank you, everyone. So, uh, I'm Bob. Uh -oh. uh, before we get started, I just wanted to, let's raise a toast to Bobby Rule, who put this whole thing Woo! together. thinking about what would you do if you were wanted to put together a national championship for Boston? I mean, I don't think you would start with Coach from Maryland, and certainly not a, an assistant coach from Portland, but we did. Uh, we got a hockey goalie to play lacrosse goalie. We got a lacrosse goalie to play midfield. A tennis star was our Christy Patman. Two football players, Bernie, Doc Ellis, were our defensemen. Two okay basketball players that I knew when I saw playing the cat. A Tuscarora soccer player, Frank Davis. Three or four Canadians. I still remember Frank Yoda. Remember coming down, we were doing crossover drills. Frank Yoda, let's go left hook, go right, Frankie. He goes like this. <laughs> uh, we, we put up the Canadians. A couple of uh, short Irishmen from Brentwood running around yelling, Tommy Lapelota, Tommy Lapelota. And then we actually had a couple of uh, actual cross players from Long Island and Baltimore, uh, Maryland, and Rochester. So that was our team. Probably not what you would think of the national championship team. But Richie somehow managed to 
mold us all together. Every guy in this team was an integral part of us. I mean, there was nobody on this team that wasn't valuable. Uh, we won the national championship tournament, the NCAA tournament, without our MVP. Bob Rules on the bench for, for injured the whole tournament. That, that says a lot about our team. And I don't know whether we hated to lose or we loved to win, but there was something about this team that knew how to win. And I was real proud to be part of it. All I can say is, I made the best friends of my life through lacrosse. Aww. It was great. Okay. And they're still my best friends. Aww. Uh, Aww. Some 
very special to speak. He was an incredible, important part of our, our team. I have a unique relationship with him. I was an opponent of him when he was at Corbin State. I was a sophomore when he was a senior at Corbin, when I was a sophomore for now. Then I, he was my coach for several years, including the national championship year. And he was my teammate on the USA team. So I thought that was pretty neat. He was uh, an opponent, my coach, and then a teammate. And I just read one thing, prototypical long stick mini. First guy that he could shoot the crap out of the ball with a long stick. Great ground ball guy, and they actually used him on the midfield on the USA team. As a long pull mini to play defense, pick up the ground ball, he could shoot. So I would like to introduce the assistant coach at that time, Mike Bones Walvogel. Say a few words. Uh, I'd just like to tell a couple stories, I guess. You get older, you have to tell stories. The first story is basically I was at the North South game and I was at the reception and I went up to somebody that had beat me in high school and college and I said, I have to work for this day. But my coach, I want to learn from this person. That was Richard Moran. We talked about it, he was having a couple of drinks, I was having a couple of drinks. And uh, he invited me over here and became, uh, became my life in history. And uh, a couple of things about Richie is just, first of all, his memory for names and people is astronomical. And one time we were walking down the street and he said, hello to some woman. And the woman just was freaking out. And he said, I met you with so-and-so at uh, an end. Wall Sand. You know Wall Sandwich? <laughs> and she said, no. And then he kept going on about the whole incident. And she said she finally realized it was true. And it's just amazing what Richie does. I mean, I came from a pretty good program in Portland. But his, his sense of being and, and relating to players is unbelievable. He can make fun of things. I mean, how many people here went to the Finiaki guy? You guys remember that? Yeah. Buck and Esteem. Yeah. Yeah. Bring France to go along with it. Um, Send you guys from Tico Hall all the way to Shaw Park. It's, it's, it's hilarious. And then Jeff Dean, who was sleeping because he was studying too much. Remember that, Rich? And he had to get out of the library. Jeff Dean was class of 70. But it just goes on and on. I mean, they just had a great time. Coaching. And it was a situation where Rich and I were the only coaches. Now there's four or five coaches in the state <coughs> taking care of them. And it's the sense of family that Rich has developed. I think you guys all know that. But you don't know what other programs are going through. That's, that's the thing. You thought everyone was going through the same thing you guys are going through. And it wasn't. And you guys had the temperament to be champions. And that's so unique. And I think Richie was a part of that. He was a great part. You guys instilled that in yourself, and he instilled that in you, and you believed in it, and that, that was the difference. And I think the biggest game of the year was the Army game, because we had a new goalkeeper, we were letting goals in, and we used an open let in, and you guys stepped up. It was just, you know, and the fact that the coach at Army was my former coach, it was even more important to me, so that was even more special to me. But I think just the friendship that we had and the camaraderie. The thing that the other thing that I thought was that really helped me coaching as a head coach is listening to my assistant. And Richie would always listen to me. I mean, one day I went in there and he said, "What's, what's the problem with the offense?" I said, "Well, the offense, the attack isn't working for the midfield. The midfield isn't working for the attack. It's got two different units, got controllers and guards, and he developed a motion offense that most of the teams use nowadays." Just things like that, just little things that help to it. You know? And I think I owe a lot to Richie and uh, I owe a lot to you guys because you guys stepped up and made it happen. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, I would be remiss though, I do want to say something about someone who unfortunately could not be here tonight, and that is the Fleckinger, Bert Fleckinger, the Fleckinger family. They were an incredible supporter of our 
our dinner, our, our uh, event, and I, I really wish that they were here. And I think he's included my emails, so if you look up, I'd love if you send it up to Bird saying whatever you felt about that. I hope, I hope you liked it. But he was a great, great part of it. So it was like a jar, Bird like a I like that. Now, I, I think we've got we're a very good with that kind of players who speak now. Now, and I, I, there, there's no pressure to speak. Um, what we like is to keep under five minutes and maybe concentrate on a theme. Uh, and so we'll do that. Uh, I'll be selfish. I'll go first just to give you an idea. Uh, my little theme was how did the on the 1971 lacrosse team affect my life? And I thought about it right, for a long time. And there are a lot of ways. But I'll give the main way confidence. I always felt like I could walk into a room of virtually uh, anybody who accomplished lots and lots, especially the money people like in Madison, the big Wall Street guys. I walk in and discuss it with millions of dollars. I say to myself, to my counsel, I said, I did something that money could not buy. You cannot buy a championship. You can't. You get a million, ten million dollars, you cannot buy it. And we did not buy it. We earned it. So when I sit with some of these big money guys, they go, I got something they don't have in my back pocket. I have a national championship, and no matter how much money they have, they don't. And for whatever reason, it's not one of those. It made me confident when I was with people who were people who accomplished a lot in their lives. And uh, so for that, again, and we go back to go back to Richie Moran and Mike Bulbul. What I said outside about uh, not only they were good guys and good teammates, and uh, so as I've gotten older, that's what my life is about. Uh, more and more, I think of friendships. Uh, I can't remember games, but I remember bus rides. I remember fooling around the locker room. It's so funny. Uh, that's what I remember more than anything. And uh, and that's the comradeship I'm talking about. So with that, would anybody like to come up? Any players like to come up and share some of the stories? Okay, Jay Pass, I saw your hand go up. Then, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, you're behind the post. I couldn't sit I'm going off script. I was screaming. I know. This is not a rule. This is not a rule. Scrap. Let me see what it says. He does not travel to unless he has the ball. I do. That's all. He's been staying with me. And in three days, he's getting the floor. But, so he opens up a page. To let me know what's in his scrapbook. So I'm just going to quote. This, I think it's from the, the Providence Sentinel. That would be Brown. And he read this because I, he starts out with me. He goes, uh, oh, One of the keys of today's success was going out with Pastor Bill Ellis. Stopping the police. But then it goes on the, the largest and most successful key was the goaltending of Bob Rule, who was outstanding. I can make say some more impossible shots that he stopped. It was just amazing to see the incredible athleticism of Bob Rule. Two things right up front. Uh, 
we, we complimented and, and commended a lot of folks for putting this together. Certainly want to recognize uh, our goalie and, and our uh, All-American Bobby Rule here. Uh, but we would be remiss that one of the real driving functions here, as with everything else we've always done, is Coach Moran. So Richie was the one who wanted to do this. He wanted to make sure we all got together. And he wanted to recognize our teammates who weren't here. So God bless you, Coach. God bless you. When I think of Cornell across, I think of endurance. So you all know I went to a different team for a handful of years after Cornell. But I used to joke with the folks on the team. And I say, hey, look, smarter than me? Yeah. Faster than me? Yeah. Stronger than me? Yeah. Outlast me? No way. No way. And we learned that at Cornell across. That's why we learned it. We learned it at Polo Barn. Uh, shoveling other stuff on the 1st of February. We learned it running up and down the stadium steps, if you tried to do them all. We learned it running down Tower Road, if Billy Lloyd didn't get on the bus. <laughs> but it was a great team, and we learned a lot of lessons, and we pushed each other. And we all know that the reason the team was good because everybody was on the team. So I'll just leave you with an old adage that they used to say in Africa. They say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go as a team. And it's yeah. great to be on a good team that went far. Thank you very much, Shay. That was wonderful. Who else would like to speak? All these hands. Who should I call them? Oh, here we go. Oh, no. So, uh, two weeks ago, I uh, was at a wedding in the Chicago area. The father of the bride came up to me in the middle of the reception and said, Is someone I want to speak to? And you can't say no to the father of the bride. So I went over and it turned out to be a woman uh, that a lot of people in this room uh, know. I know Richie knows her for sure. And, uh, uh, Kelly Lamonti. Currently, uh, a coach at Northwestern. She's been there maybe 20 years or so. This one. Uh, several national championships for the women's team, right? and she was, uh, you know, very interested in the fact that I was involved with the Cornell Lacrosse program. And she basically, uh, she also, uh, as you know, started to achieve a long term at, at Maryland for the women's program. Probably one of the top women's lacrosse player, I would say, of the women's <laughs> and uh, a great, uh, successful coach. And she basically uh, said how much she admired the Cornell men's lacrosse program. And she didn't explain in a lot of detail, but basically had to do with groups like this. You know, the alumni group, the strength of the program, and the year after year after year strength. So it made me think, why is that with all the Princeton and Brown to Carolina and why, why does this, to a woman like that, who's been involved in the trust for 40 plus years now, uh, we look at our program and, and call it out, and she was uh, quite sincere without question, and I'm gonna kind of uh, parrot what Andy said, it, it, in my mind there's no question that it's Richie Moran. Thank, thank you, Richie, and Pat as well. Thank you, Patty. One more thing. Kelly Monte's brother was Tony Monte. He was a great hockey player. He played for Chicago, the Blackhawks. And just as an aside, pardon me? So what? <laughs> Sorry, I was a big guy. I'm sick of those guys breaking my heart. So I, yeah. uh, but I did one little, little thing about uh, Tony and Kelly Monte. They have a uh, Massachusetts Athletic Hall of Fame. And here's Tony, the great hockey player, all star. And he doesn't get in, his sister gets in first. <laughs> There's a big article about it. So she was, as like you said, she was a great coach, is a great coach uh, out at, um, at Northwestern. All right, who else would like to speak? 
All right, Max. Uh, I've often heard about and believed the fact that the 1970 team got robbed and they were still voting championships among the southern schools with handed to one another every so often. And that year, I think there were, they wound up voting a three-way championship when you had an undefeated team in college lacrosse. And I got, my father is a coach at a prep school, was a coach, football coach at a prep school uh, for years, and a lot of the parentage were there, a lot of muckety-mucks. And one of the guys, uh, father of the quarterback, ran Sports Illustrated back in the day when Sports Illustrated was the Bible of sports. And it turned out my father heard the story from him that that year they overlooked Cornell and voted a three-way championship in some three southern schools. And Sports Illustrated gave him a one-page, back-page article. So the lacrosse establishment, Southern establishment, complained to Sports Illustrated. And they said, why, why don't you give us more coverage? And Sports Illustrated, after a suitably noteworthy pause and shaking of head and just say, we'll cover lacrosse when you guys start playing a tournament for a champion. So I think that's just one more of those elements that I just heard about and filled in the picture quite completely on why they decided in 1971 they were going to have an NCAA championship. And as you recall, there was some Texas millionaire who put out a uh, video on the top lacrosse teams that would be playing for the championship, and Cornell was not among them. <laughs> so, so many people were so wrong for so long. Thank you very much. Before we get to play, I, uh, sports writer came down from uh, the uh, Sports Illustrated to uh, interview some players and, and uh, interviewed myself out and other guys. And he asked me about Richie Grant, what kind of coach is he? My answer was, he's Irish, what else do I have to say? So I think that kind of sums up that incredibly open personality, a guy who enjoyed life to the fullest. Joyce liked to the In fact, when I did camps with him, I ended up at the table sound asleep, and he still was going strong until so one or two in the morning. He'd get up at seven the next day, clear and wide awake as anything, ride and go stagger around the field for a while. So a man of boundless energy. And as I said, I thought, and it's in the, it's in the school of social art was that he's Irish. So I think that kind of summed it up. Uh, anybody else like to speak? Right. Good evening, everyone, and a special hello and welcome to my teammates, you humps. <laughs> there are a lot of things that go into a national championship team. A lot of them are measurable and unpredictable. Uh, Bobby Shaw mentioned hating to lose as one of those things, and by the time you came along to join the varsity, uh, we had suffered some serious uh, losses in the previous year in the 1969 season. Um, things were not real good at the beginning of that season. We lost a couple of Ivy League games, and uh, it was a uh, transition period. Uh, Richie had come in and was taking over a team that uh, had been 35 and 1 under Ned Marcus. And uh, we were losers for a while. And it was hard to accept that. Uh, we were definitely experiencing adversity. Uh, coaching staff referred to us as, quote, lower than whale ship on the bottom of the ocean. Um, it was tough, but there was motivation there. There was talent there. There was a will to win there. 
And when we won, when we shared the Ivy League title at the end of that season, co-captain Pete Pierce smiled and quit. I guess well shit blows. <laughs> After that, the, the uh, 1970 season, I would have hoped that the uh, members of the 1970 team, the seniors of that year, would have been able to attend this event because for me, uh, they were that national championship that we won was just as much a national championship for them because they had showed us how to win. They had been showed us excellent leadership. They had class. Uh, they were, they were, that was just a special group that I, I remember Glenn Mueller saying that's possibly the best team Cornell ever had. They never got to play for a national championship. Um, again, there's so many things that go into a national championship. It's hard to pinpoint three or four that are a key. There are thousands of lacrosse players, excellent lacrosse players, that never get to play in a national championship. So just that opportunity is one thing. There are hundreds of teams that are excellent teams that practice possibly almost as hard as we did. They never get a chance to play in a national championship. Uh, a lot of hard work, opportunity, and uh, we were fortunate to make the best of that. Uh, I never thought about what second place was. never had to think about so much what second place was like in uh, 2012 when Richie got his uh, Lifetime to work an Achievement Award. And Amy McEnany was awarded uh, the legend, the second uh, Legends of the Cross Award. I wanted to attend that ceremony, and in the reception area before that, I happened to be talking to a player from the Maryland team that we had played against. And this was 40 years later. He said he never got over it in his life. He never got over losing that game. Yeah. And I, it never occurred to me what what second place was like because with Richie, we didn't have to experience that. So I'm awful grateful for what he put us through and what we're able to achieve. Thank you, Richie. But 
Some of you may know that in 1989, I uh, established the Richie Moran Award, uh, which is given at the Hall of Fame dinner to one senior athlete who has the best combination of the attributes of uh, academic and athletic excellence and ambassadorship for Cornell. But I want you all to remember, as you know, teams that were after you all graduated uh, earned a 42-game winning streak, which is considered to be one of the greatest accomplishments in the history of Division I lacrosse. But there was another equally impressive record that you all were a direct participants in, and that is a record that may never be broken, and that is Richie Moran won his 100th victory in his 114th game. And so, you all were part of that. Anybody who played since, uh, since Richie arrived at Cornell, his first 114 games, he won 100 of them. And you all are participants in, in, in a large number of those. So that's a record that's uh, equally as impressive as a 42-game winning streak. And I want to make sure you all are aware of that because whenever I give the Richie Moran Award, I always mention it to make sure nobody ever forgets it. And I'm so happy to see a lot of my friends here today and very happy to see our current coaches who are going to bring Cornell back to the pinnacle yeah. yeah. sometime in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know Coach were 100 and 114. That's, a, that's an incredible record. Now, I have a question, just out of curiosity. How many people danced here 50 years ago? Put your hands up. How many people here danced well 50 years ago? Oh, I know, this place, when I found out the Lake Washington was the old door 40, I asked Nicole to look for the plaque with my name on it, Bob Rule Dancer, if you've never found it, it's kind of depressing. Now, would anybody else like to speak? Yes, Mr. Wade.
And that's what makes it such a great literature. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Very nice. Uh, well, anybody else have to uh, say something? Okay. Mr. Bradley?
you for uh, being allowed to be a member of this great family. Um, I grew up on an Indian reservation and we grew up playing the creator's game. Um, it just came natural to pick up all the prospects when you're a young child, learn all the skills. When you become part of the team, you learn. We all come to the game with different skill sets. Richie knew how to use those skills for every member of that team. He interchanged people doing different aspects of the game to win. So you learn by a leader like that and by everybody's skill, you learn trust. We had such a great time going to practices every day, having fun, and he gave us the perfect balance of toughness and that plus having fun doing it. It's a sport, it's a game, you're supposed to have fun. And I just want to thank Richie and all the Cornell community, Cornell Cross, thank you for allowing me to be part of it.
us a lot of time to talk to Rick and what a good guy he was. Again, a good guy and a good teammate. Wonderful. Uh, I would like now, if, if we could, I, I, I'd like to um, thank Nicole for the staff here. I don't, Nicole, are you there? I think they all went home. I'm not sure. Where's the staff? Is nobody here with us? Yeah, Rich is making breakfast. Well, anyways, uh, this became a venue that... Is, is Nicole in there? Or anybody? Is she coming out? Yeah. Nicole! Yes, I do. I practice. So practice it. But thank you very much for that. I thought the service and everything was terrific. And we really appreciate what you guys did. Yeah. So thank you. Have a great night.